Thank you, Michael and Morgan. At LTV Facts at Five, we're constantly striving to update the local community during this time of COVID-19. Joining us today is United States Representative Lee Zeldin. He represents Congressional District 1, which includes most of Central and Eastern Suffolk County. Congressman Zeldin, thank you so much for joining us at Facts at Five. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yes, well, we're looking forward to updating our local communities. I know you're in communication with different local leaders here. Can you tell us um, recently about some phone calls that you've had? I know there's been some good news in terms of relief to Long Island taxpayers and start us off with that. Yeah, the communication has been great through this process and whether you are at a village or town level or county, state or federal, everyone is in communication with each other to uh, share ideas, answer questions, to work together to get through this. And it's important not only to be bipartisan, but there should just be no partisanship at all with so much of what we're discussing. Uh, so we had a call this week with the East End town supervisors and mayors, as well as some of our local hospital administrators. And I think it's a key for uh, all of us to, to be working together as, as much as possible throughout this process. Uh, for, for me, uh, our priorities uh, have included driving additional state and local government funding. Uh, and, and that's been partly how to deploy money that was appropriate under the CARES Act, uh, right. which has already passed Congress. I want to see additional flexibility in how that money can be spent because it can only be spent on COVID related expenses mm -hmm. uh, to drive funding to uh, populations under 500,000 people because the CARES Act, they only drove money to 500,000 population and above. Uh, and additionally, um, where we've been had some we've had some success in uh, this municipal liquidity facility that was created to expand access for Suffolk County. And hearing about PPE concerns or what a local mayor or town supervisor might be hearing from local business owners, uh, the communication has been fantastic. So that call you referenced was one of many just this week. All right. Well, we're glad, happy that everybody is cooperating with each other and, and communicating, which is, sounds essential. Um, in terms of small businesses, you know, there was quite a bit of money that seemed available you know, and then, and then in two weeks, it seemed a lot of it was exhausted and some people had difficulty with loans. Do you, how do you see that working going forward? Is there going to be more relief um, for, I mean, you know, small businesses in Long Island, obviously, is, is such a big part of our economy. Tell us about that. There have been two tranches of the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP. There's also been money that's been given out under something called the EIDL, Emergency Injury Disaster Loans. That was actually the first pot of money that our local small businesses had access to uh, when a disaster declaration was issued for the state of New York, which included Suffolk County. The EIDL would allow a small business to apply for up to $2 million of a loan. The Paycheck Protection Program is up to $10 million of a loan with a generous loan forgiveness provision. As you pointed out, there's been some feedback, especially after that first tranche, and not enough money was being given to that smallest of loans, that smallest of local small businesses, uh, and half of our nation's workforce is made up of small businesses. What we've seen over the course of this second tranche of money getting distributed is that a lot more is going out to uh, these smallest businesses and these smaller loans. Uh, we've seen the average size, a fraction of the size of the first tranche. Uh, we've also seen lenders do a better job than uh, what we saw with that first tranche of money. So I'm happy to, to see the improvement. Uh, every day we're seeing additional guidance uh, coming out, maybe from the Department of Treasury, the Small Business Administration, uh, and others in order to approve, uh, improve what uh, really is congressional intent and I think U.S. taxpayer intent in order to get through this. That's great. In terms of the, the municipal liquidity fund, can you explain a little bit about how that worked? I know that we were almost, we didn't really quite qualify and then you efforted uh, it so that we were able to access some of that money. Explain how that works and how it, it affects us. The Federal Reserve, working with the Department of Treasury, create, stood up a municipal liquidity facility. And when they stood it up, in order to qualify, a city would have to have a population of one million or more, or a county would have to have a population of two million or more. Here in Suffolk County, we don't have a population of two million, but we're not that far away. And we do have well over one million, close to one and a half million residents here in the county. 
So uh, working with the Secretary of Treasury and the Chairman of the Federal Reserve and Suffolk County Executive Steve Ballone and the County Comptroller, we all worked together with this advocacy, which included a, a phone call that was set up uh, the Thursday night before the expansion was approved between myself and the Secretary of Treasury and the County Executive in order to be able to make that localized, personalized pitch for Suffolk County and for that expansion. So fortunately, just a few days after uh, that phone call took place and after letters were written by many people and other conversations were, were had, the decision was made to expand the municipal liquidity facility where now it includes Suffolk County. And that allows the county to, to do short-term, low interest rate borrowing uh, that will help our county get through it. It helps Suffolk County taxpayers. Uh, it provides flexibility for fiscal decisions that otherwise uh, the county would not other, otherwise be able to entertain. So it's, it was important to get approved uh, and it was great working with uh, the county executive and with the leadership uh, in Washington uh, amongst the Secretary of Treasury and the Chair of Federal Reserve to get this over the finish line. That's great. Um, now we know that obviously in New York and Long Island, some of the hardest hit spots in the country uh, in terms of this COVID-19 and PPE has been vital to our front lines it continues to be. Um, we don't know if there's going to be a second or third wave of this. Can you talk about what has come to Suffolk County in terms of PPE and, and how we are also preparing for the future? Well, as far as preparing for the future, I believe that it's so important that between our national stockpile, our state stockpiles, and a domestic emergency manufacturing plan, that never again should the United States have to rely on some foreign country, some foreign adversary, uh, whether it's ventilators, personal protective equipment, and to the maximum extent possible, uh, medicines as well. So as far as looking forward to the future, we need to learn lessons and be better prepared uh, going forward for a pandemic in a way like we've never been prepared in the past. But we're working through this and, and together with, uh, from the president, vice president, and uh, others at the federal level, uh, down to the local level, working very closely with the county executive, Steve Ballone, uh, over the course of the last month, uh, we've been able to get 1.2 million additional pieces of personal protective equipment. And it started about a month ago. It was a Saturday evening. I was contacted by the county executive's office, and he mentioned that the county stockpile was out of regular size N95 masks, surgical masks, gowns, uh, face shields, and more. And that evening, I was on the phone with the, the White House, and over the course of the next 48 hours, we saw hundreds of thousands of pieces of additional PPE come to Suffolk County, and that has continued since. So it's been an important, great, strong, a nonpartisan partnership, and it's one that we must continue until we're out on the other side of this. And as I mentioned here at the beginning of my answer, uh, long-term, going forward, we need to be better prepared uh, in a way like we've never been prepared in the past. Do you see additional funding coming into some of the hardest hits, uh, the hardest hit hospitals in Long Island? So the, the, the CARES Act allocated money for hospitals, and then there was an additional $75 billion approved for hospitals uh, in the bill after the CARES Act. Uh, so the, the money that uh, was first started being given out from the CARES Act in a way that wasn't giving Long Island uh, and the New York City metropolitan area hospitals our fair share. So uh, I was advocating directly to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, and I had calls with him and, and with the Deputy Secretary that the, the rest of the CARES Act money, as well as this new $75 billion pot, should factor in uh, hard hit coronavirus hotspots. It should factor in losses on the expense side and the revenue side, and it should drive more money to our local hospitals. So after that first tranche of CARES Act money went out, uh, we have seen additional money go out targeted to areas like ours, and uh, th that's a much better approach, in my opinion, than what uh, the, the first pot of money from the CARES Act went out as and uh, we'll see as hospitals have their needs going forward what additional funding is necessary. And I think it's key to, uh, to get our hospitals whatever support that they need in order to survive this. 
Okay, that's great. Um, you obviously have been appointed to the president's Open Up America Again congressional group. It's a bipartisan effort, which, I, which, which sounds like to us that you have the president's ear. What can you tell us about some of the thinking and the plans to get the economy back and how specifically that affects us locally? Yeah, so this has been going on now, these conversations for a few weeks. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had a, I met with the president for about an hour and a half, Neil Lofts, talking about so many topics, some of which are coming up on this conversation. Uh, and we've had a, we've had one phone call as a group, and then there was another project where everyone was submitting uh, a memo with ideas. A lot of the focus is based off of economics, but it's not exclusively with regards to economics. Uh, health is a massive concern. It's um, really priority number one when you're doing a reopening is to do it smartly and precisely in a way that prevents another outbreak. Uh, on the economic front, though, you can't paint the whole country with one broad brush. There are, there, there are issues as far as density. Uh, we have seen different impacts amongst uh, areas in different regions of the country, uh, different climates, uh, for whatever reason, or maybe because there's less travel through one particular city versus another. There's so many different factors at play here. Uh, and even within a state, one part of a state might be able to open up before another. And we're seeing it here in New York State where upstate you have far less density, you have far less cases, uh, and they may be in a position to be a foot ahead of uh, an area downstate. And I understand that. Uh, I talked to a colleague while you know, Suffolk and Nassau County now has a well over 70,000 positive cases. Uh, I have colleagues where in their massive congressional district, they only have a few dozen cases. And for, for them not to open, waiting for Midtown Manhattan to be ready, obviously that doesn't make sense. You know, talking about Suffolk County and, and, and in Long Island, we are blessed with beautiful beaches, you know, a topography that attracts a lot of visitors. It's a, our economy thrives on it in the summer. For people who are heading into that season with such great fear and uncertainty about how this is going to play out this summer, what do you say to local people here, you know, in terms of hanging on and hanging tight and being hopeful? I think we've all learned so much more about what we can do individually uh, with our own mitigation efforts. Certainly, we have so much of our environment around us ramping up their own mitigation efforts. So this summer is not going to be like summers in the past. Yes, we have this health concern, but we also, on the encouraging side of, of this, we also have people in our surroundings who are aware of what's going on and they're taking measures to help us. And whether you're going to a restaurant or you're going to shop somewhere maybe over the summer for retail, uh, or if it's something for entertainment, you wanna go to a, a movie or a bowling alley, uh, I am sure that as everything is getting reopened, it's not just going to be a snap of the fingers and everything returns to normal. As far as our individual behavior, if you are a, a, if you're older, if you have underlying health concerns, uh, if you feel like you uh, are susceptible in a, in a very enhanced way you're concerned about, uh, that might impact how much you go out. Um, but if you do go out, uh, you, know, you can maintain your physical distancing with other people. You can wear a mask. You can have others wear a mask. Uh, you can wear gloves. You can use hand sanitizer. Uh, and I, I believe that, uh, that Long Islanders shouldn't just stay in their, their home through the summer uh, out of that fear. Um, but I also wouldn't want to paint that with one broad brush because you know, people have, you know, some people work in different types of businesses. Uh, they have a different health situation, uh, but everyone can do their part to hopefully get through this stronger than ever. We have a little time left. I just wanted to talk quickly about what happened last week with the flyover with the Navy's Blue Angels and the uh, Air Force Thunderbirds, which was very impressive. What does it take for to coordinate that and and how do you think that makes us feel in terms of you know so many people frontline people veterans it's it was impressive yeah you know it's interesting there are some people who aren't impressed and then there are others who are yeah and then there are others who are and it's 
uh, you know, we've seen the videos outside of these hospitals, whether it's our local hospitals uh, here on Long Island, or it's been all the way down to, to Georgia and many locations in between. And you see all of the, the medical professionals coming out of the hospital, they're taking a break. They feel the love, they feel the support, and there's, there's a spiritual uh, connection. There's a patriotic connection. There's a service connection because you know, those uh, men and women who serve in our military, maybe in generations past, they'll go thousands of miles away from home and the front line might be in the Middle East or it might mm. be in Asia. Here with this battle, it's a different type of profession uh, there are men and women who are on the front lines. This time it's right in our own backyard. Yeah. And what, what I thought was, was so cool about that moment was that connection that you can, you can feel it with the video coming out of the cockpit of the, the fighter jet, or it's coming from what you can tell the, the passion and the excitement of that healthcare professional is that we are all united. And in this particular case, whether it's them, our law enforcement, our grocery store workers, our truckers, our farmers, uh, the front line looks different like no other battle we've ever fought in the past. And I thought from that standpoint, it was uh, a really special moment to take in. Representative Lee Zeldin, thank you so much for updating us and our local community and for all of these bipartisan efforts and uh, for joining us at LTV Facts at Five. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Stay healthy, stay safe. Speak soon. Same to you. Thank you.